Chapter 13 Mistakes to Avoid Like all endeavors, law school exams offer countless opportunity for mistakes. From the simplest failure to read the question to the most subtle misunderstanding of complex legal doctrine. Certain errors, however, repeatedly appear, in large part, because professors are asking you to do things on law school exams that are different from what you did in college and even different from what you've done in your legal research and writing courses. Here are some mistakes we have seen with great frequency in the course of grading thousands of exams. Tip hash 16. Don't regurgitate legal rules and principles. If you've been a law student for more than a week, you've no doubt begun to figure out that rule memorization regurgitation doesn't get you very far in class discussion. It won't get you very far in the exam setting either. For on the one hand, the rules are not enough, and on the other, the rules are way too much when it comes to writing law exams. Here's how you can learn to avoid both of these pitfalls. Rules are not enough, part one. You get credit for applying the law, not for regurgitating it. Unless you decide to specialize in handling the legal problems of first-year law students, chances are you'll never have a client walk into your office and ask, what are the seven elements of adverse possession? Instead, most clients will offer up facts events that have already taken place or things that they think or worry might happen and ask you to explain the legal implications and consequences. Imagine, for example, that a client tells you that he and his brother have been mooring their sailboat at a seemingly abandoned dock near their beach house for the past eight summers, and that they want to know the risks of spending a substantial sum to fix up the dock. It may be useful to explain briefly the concept of adverse possession and to describe the elements, but if you stop there, you wouldn't have helped the client with his problem. What will help him is an analysis that applies each of the elements to the particular facts and circumstances he has presented. They moor at the dock only in the summer. Would that constitute continuous use? Does merely tying the boat to the dock establish actual possession? So too, with a law exam presenting this client's problem as a question. While a brief explanation of adverse possession and a listing of the elements may be a good starting point, what separates the superior answer from the barely passing is the ability to apply those legal concepts to the facts and, in particular, to identify the difficulties or ambiguities that might arise in the course of that application. Rules are not enough. Part Roman 2 An ounce of analysis is worth a pound of law. If you weren't successful as an undergraduate, you wouldn't be in law school today. Yet frequently success in an undergraduate program is the result of committing to memory the contents of lectures and readings and of parroting those contents back on quizzes and finals. It would therefore be no surprise if you found yourself tempted to deploy the same technique in law school by using the law exam as an opportunity to demonstrate to the professor that you have learned a lot of law. The difficulty with this kind of thinking is that it is indeed necessary to learn a lot of law in order to succeed in law school but it is nowhere near sufficient. The typical law exam tests your ability to use legal rules and principles to analyze and argue about particular facts and problems. To be sure, you can't use rules you don't know, but merely showing that you know them, for example, to continue our illustration, by briefly reciting the elements of adverse possession, is only a start. To excel, you have to show that you know how to apply the rules, and to do that, You've got to use them to analyze the facts and problems presented in the question. Rules are too much, part I. Lengthy quotations of legal rules waste precious time. The typical law school exam gives you a series of questions that could easily take you a week or more to answer fully. But for better or for worse, you have only three or four hours within which to complete your work. As a result, time is at a premium, and you need to use every available minute analyzing the facts presented in the questions in light of the legal rules and principles you've learned in your coursework. To be sure, brief quotations of pertinent rules e.g. the clear and present danger test in constitutional law or a definite and seasonable expression of acceptance under UCC. 2207 in contracts may demonstrate to the grader that you know precisely what is in dispute in a particular problem. But the ability to quote verbatim lengthy excerpts from cases, from statutes, from the federal rules, 
or from the restatement would be useful only to a monk copying sacred scripture before the invention of the printing press. For a law student faced with the task of writing an exam, it is of no use at all. Rules are too much, part two. A lengthy paraphrase may be even worse than a lengthy quotation. Some students seem to think they will get credit for merely regurgitating legal rules if they put them in their own words, instead of quoting them verbatim. But this is a lose-lose proposition. At best, they will succeed only in wasting the time spent rephrasing rather than applying the legal rules to the facts presented in the question. A clever law student could, for example, come up with more than 5,000 ways in which to rearrange the seven elements of adverse possession, but he won't get any credit for such efforts from the professor. At worst, and given the high-pressure setting of a law exam and the formidable challenges of legal drafting, this is an extremely common scenario. The would-be paraphraser will restate the rule incorrectly. If she gets the rule wrong in a way that makes a difference in the analysis of the problem, the mistake may have a devastating effect on her entire answer. But even if she gets the rule wrong in a way that doesn't really matter, her sloppiness is likely make a poor impression on the grader. Depending on the professor, this may result in points off as well all for doing something for which she wouldn't get any credit, even if she'd done it properly. Tip hash 17. Don't repeat the facts. In your first year legal writing course, you may have learned that the best way to begin a legal memorandum is by restating the facts of the problem you've been asked to research. Although this is a useful format for memo writing, it's a bad way to organize an answer for most law exams. Here are the reasons. You get credit for analyzing the facts, not for copying them into your blue books. Clients want their lawyers to help them make legal sense of facts that the clients know all too well. So as law students you can expect to be rewarded for your ability to make legal sense out of the facts you're given i.e. to analyze and argue about them in light of the legal principles you have learned in your courses. By contrast, the ability to parrot back facts is useful mostly to a parrot. Thus, for example, if a hypothetical on a first-year property exam explicitly states that Sally holds a vested remainder, the student who begins his answer with Sally holds a vested remainder, or even the legal interest that Sally holds is a vested remainder, is getting zero credit and going nowhere fast. At the same time, his classmate who starts straight away by discussing the significance of the fact i.e. by explaining what difference it might make to the legal analysis of the problem is already miles ahead e.g. because Sally holds a vested remainder. She faces no problems under the rule against perpetuities. Repeating the facts wastes precious time. We make the same point here that we made about regurgitating legal rules. On law exams, time is at a premium, and you need to use every available minute answering the questions. Any time spent merely repeating them is a complete waste. Repeating the facts conveys uncertainty and annoys the grader. Deep down most students already know that fact regurgitation won't get them the grades they desire. So why, it is fair to ask, do so many students nevertheless fall into parrot mode when they come face to face with their blue books? Here's one answer we hear from students, particularly those who are unhappy with their exam performance. After reading the question, I was so confused and stressed out that the only thing I was sure of was the facts so I figured I couldn't go wrong by repeating them and getting at least that much right. But here's the rub. We professors were law students once, and in any event, we've read enough blue books to be hip to this trick. Thus, when a student begins an answer by restating the facts, he is sending the message loud and clear that he isn't sure what to do with the question, and that makes a poor first impression on the grader. What's worse? The grader wrote those facts. Indeed, she probably spent a lot of time developing them and working out the details. Faced with the prospect of reading 60, 80, 100, or 120 blue books, she is likely to be extremely annoyed if she has to read them again and again and again. Attempts to paraphrase are likely to get you in trouble. Once again, you can't solve the regurgitation problem whether you are regurgitating law or facts by paraphrasing rather than quoting. At best, you will succeed only in wasting the time spent rephrasing rather than analyzing the facts presented. 
At worst, you will get the facts wrong in some small but significant way that can undermine your entire answer. Consider, for example, a contract's hypothetical in which some facts suggest that Ali has made an offer and other facts suggest that he has only invited one. A paraphrase of the hypothetical that even inadvertently emphasizes one view and ignores the other is a deadly error. Since the professor is undoubtedly testing to see whether the student can argue the facts both ways. In sum, you gain nothing and stand to lose a lot by attempting to paraphrase the facts. The facts are already written down. If you pull into a toll booth and ask directions to the George Washington Bridge, the attendant might well repeat your question back to you. So, you want to get to the bridge? Your kids in the back seat might crack wise, duh, how did he ever guess? But the toll collector is no doubt making a legitimate attempt to ensure he heard the question right before trying to answer it. Unlike the toll collector, however, a law student who wants to make sure she has the facts right can, and indeed she should simply go back and read them again. She gains nothing by repeating them into her blue book. Tip hash 18. Avoid conclusory answers. Imagine you and your best friend have just finished reading a great novel like Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. You're excited to talk about it, and you call your friend on the phone. Did you like the book, you ask? Yes, he says. Do you think there was any merit to Raskolnikov's original thinking about justifications for murder? You inquire. No, he replies. What do you think ultimately led to Raskolnikov's downfall? You press on. Guilt, he mutters. Not much of a conversation, is it? Your professors can't write like Dostoevsky. But we do our best to pose problems we find interesting, and that we hope will challenge you to think. So, if after a long fact pattern we put a question to you like, Does Jill's suit have merit? It is highly unlikely that yes or no, for that matter, will prove a satisfactory answer. We are at least as interested in why you have drawn a particular conclusion as in the conclusion itself. Nor is this a mere aesthetic preference. Your professional life will depend on persuading people to act and judges to rule as you wish. It's unlikely that clipped conclusions will push them in the desired direction. You might be able to get by with one-word answers when you are telling a client that, yes, she may go forward with her plans. But if your answer is, no, you had better have a detailed explanation for why and a further consideration of other possible alternatives and why those will or won't work. Explaining why is the watchword of a successful practice, and that goes double for exam performance. Be wary of conclusory terms. It is seldom a good idea to begin a point in your essay with phrases like, it is obvious that, or clearly. If you are correct, and the point you are making is obvious, then the chances are good that this isn't the issue the professor is hoping to see you discuss. So if it is obvious that Joe will sue Sally for breach of contract, then it's likely the important issues are what defenses Sally has and whether Joe will ultimately prevail. Alternatively, and still worse, the point you are making may not be obvious at all. Think how unhappy your professor will be to read you saying, it's obvious the rule against perpetuities doesn't apply. When there's a strong argument that it does. Don't say what, say why. Law school exams often present ambiguous circumstances. A contract or deed can be interpreted in different ways. A statute can be read to have different meanings. A defendant can be seen as having acted negligently or not. It's important to choose which interpretation of events is more compelling. But it's not enough. In many cases, for example, where there are only two plausible readings, you could pick the right one 50% of the time just by guessing. So it's unlikely the professor will be impressed with a mere conclusion. If an anti-discrimination statute might be read as requiring the defendant to have intended to discriminate, and you see no evidence of intent, then it's a good first step to say the defendant isn't liable because the intent element is missing. But if you don't go on to explain why you see intent as an element of the statute based on the plain meaning of the language, the legislative history, the case law interpreting similar statutes, or some other factor, then your answer is stopping short. Every conclusion you draw should have a why attached to it. Always anticipate rejoinders.
even after you have spelled out all the reasons why you believe a legal issue should be resolved in a particular way, you are still only halfway home. You should next ask yourself what arguments an imaginary opponent might raise that would push the decision-maker in the opposite direction. After you have written down how you would respond to the strongest arguments that cut against your position, you will then have truly tackled the question the way it was written. Anyone can reach a conclusion if the arguments the other way aren't adequately presented. But to write a persuasive answer, you need to rebut the best that the other side might have to offer. See tip hash 12. Argue both sides. Tip hash 19. Avoid disquisitions on topics outside the course. Although you may sometimes have your doubts, your professors generally aren't out to fool you by asking questions about topics not covered during the course. We put a great deal of effort into properly explaining the issues we cover, and we want to find out how much you have learned about them. So if you are convinced that the real issue on one of your property exam questions is whether the defendant violated the antitrust laws, try thinking it over again. The antitrust issue you think you see is probably not there, but in any event there is most certainly a property law issue that you are missing. This doesn't mean you should never make quick mention of a legal issue you believe is relevant, even if you never discussed it in class. Most professors are happy to see creative thinking, and even more delighted if you raise facts about the real world that you know from personal experience. But if you find yourself going on and on about something from another course, from some other field, or worst of all from a commercial outline stop, the grade you save may be your own. Know your topics well, and use your syllabus as a guide. Many of you will be quick to agree that it's foolish to spend time writing about issues not covered in the course. It's one thing, however, to avoid antitrust issues on the property exam, and quite another to remember every issue covered so as to know whether to include it. There's always the fear that, even though you don't remember covering something, it was in fact a focus of considerable course scrutiny. Our first reaction to this is that if you are taking school seriously, you probably remember a lot more than you think. So if you really don't remember covering something, you probably did not. Often the professor will provide a syllabus with headings that make the course issues easier to remember. And if the exam is open book, there's probably no better document to have on hand. But here again we'd like to stress that there are no substitutes for knowing the material. Topics discussed in class should be your first study priority. Topics in the readings should be next. These two will keep you plenty busy so that you don't need more. You can't afford to waste time. It's the rare exam question that doesn't contain several difficult issues built on the main topics of study. A constitutional law question that centers around state action may also involve an issue on the merits and even a standing question as well. You may spot the state action issue and become convinced that if the defendant is found to be a state actor, then there's a follow-up issue of whether the defendant has an absolute or qualified immunity from suit. You may have even written your moot court brief on the immunity of certain public officials. The odds are good, however, that you spent little, if any time on immunity issues in your constitutional law course. If you insist on showing off to the professor how much you know about immunity, you'll probably run out of time to talk about the merits and may even miss the standing issue altogether. Don't do it. If the professor spent time teaching you about standing, that's probably what she wants to hear about. Remember, you are trying to convince her C tip hash 14. Remember who your judge is, that you have learned the course. You'll have plenty of time for disquisitions on immunity elsewhere. Venturing beyond the course risks extra mistakes. Going beyond the course material not only wastes time, it increases the odds that you'll make mistakes. You aren't likely to get much credit for material the professor isn't seeking. But the professor is certain to be displeased if you bring up other issues and then get them wrong. Moreover, mistakes are more likely for at least two reasons. First, no matter how well you know another body of law, you aren't likely to know it as well as you know the material that you've focused on like a laser beam while getting ready for the exam. Second, most areas of law offer considerable room for interpretation you are likely to understand your professor's take on the material that you covered in the course. But you will be hard-pressed to predict her understanding of other topics. 
Material you picked up as gospel somewhere else, whether that be in another course, or from a commercial outline, may strike your professor as poppycock. Quoting it back to her isn't likely to improve your performance. Be brief, and you will be saved. Sometimes you just can't resist discussing other topics. Sometimes you'll even be correct. You'll have spotted an issue from another body of law that actually is more relevant to the problem than anything your professor considered. Your professor will give you enormous credit for creativity, if only you have the courage to follow your instincts. Though these occasions will be rare, they will happen, and you don't want knee-jerk tips following to inhibit you. The answer here is simple. If upon reflection, or at least as much reflection as you have time for during an exam, you remain convinced that an issue outside the course is crucial, flag it. Explain briefly why and how you think it's relevant and move on. You'll get all the credit you can expect. You'll risk little time. And if you have made a mistake, the professor will care much less if you haven't been distracted from the key issues she is trying to test. This is a good rule for most of life, but exam pressure makes it hard to follow, especially when you are eager to show off your most recent legal learning. Here are some simple things to remember that will help you sound not only like a good student of your latest lessons, but also like someone whom your professor can imagine someday handling a client's affairs. Rules are made to be broken. You worked hard all semester learning rules so complicated they made your head swim. You know now that landlords are bound by a warranty of habitability, and that if an apartment doesn't comply with the housing code, the tenant may cease paying rent. You also know that providing hot water is an essential part of almost every housing code. Rote rule application might lead you to conclude that a tenant in an exam question could stay rent-free for months in a luxury apartment merely because there's no hot water in the jacuzzi. But you know in the real world this would never happen. It shouldn't happen on your exams either. Don't ignore your experience. It's easy to get confused about legal terminology. You may recall that the Supreme Court has found a fundamental right to travel without remembering precisely what that means. It might also occur to you that any state rule that restricts your freedom, let's say to hunt as you wish, could be described as interfering with your travel rights. I can hunt in my home state without any special training in gun safety. So why can't I do that here? But however savvy it sounds to your legal mind to challenge state hunting restrictions as unconstitutional infringements on travel, you know in your bones, even if you've never picked up a gun, that states already regulate things like hunting. Try then to be very careful about reaching exam conclusions that contradict the way you know the world to be organized. In short, if your recollection of the Commerce Clause cases convinces you that it's unconstitutional for a state to operate a public university. You probably should rethink your recollection before telling your professor at the University of State X to give back his or her paycheck. Don't demand the impossible. You have carefully mastered the requirements of due process of law. Your exam question imagines that to receive a tax credit for college tuition, a student must maintain a B average. A lot is at stake now in every student grade and a review of the professor's grades could surely find errors. So your instinct is that every student at a public university has a right to a formal hearing to contest any grade below a B. Stop right there. However logical this might sound, you know it won't happen. So don't tell the professor that the law now demands it without being very clear. You mean this in a purely theoretical sense. Distinguish the is from the ought. Suppose you have a creative theory you believe invalidates a practice, which your experience tells you goes on all the time. You remember, for example, that the Supreme Court has found it to be unconstitutional state action for a court to enforce a racially restrictive covenant. Your exam question is about a neighbor who holds Ku Klux Klan rallies in his backyard and calls the cops to evict any African Americans who seek to attend. If you want to argue that in principle, there's no difference between the cop's involvement here and the court's involvement in the Covenant's case. More power to you. Your professor will reward you for creativity, especially if you are sensitive to available counterarguments. But if instead you summarily conclude that the neighbor can't ask the cops to help, you will have confused what you think the law should be with what it is in a way that will hurt you every time. 
Tip hash 21. Avoid writing jurisprudence lectures. Law school classes spend a great deal of energy on time-honored questions of law that transcend individual subjects. When should rules be strictly enforced, and when should an exception be made? When should the needs of the community trump the rights of the individual and vice versa? Do citizens owe allegiance to immoral laws? Like most students, you may have developed strong views on such questions. Save them for when the professor asks for your opinion. In the meantime, use your understanding of deeper issues to answer the question at hand. Seeing how your problem is only part of a more general dilemma should help you write a better answer to your problem. It shouldn't spur you toward a lengthy philosophical essay about the dilemma itself. Always keep the question in mind. You have studied so hard and learned so much that the temptation is almost irresistible to let the professor know about your newfound erudition. Don't give in. The professor wants your reaction to the question at hand, not your thoughts on big-picture questions or related legal issues. So let's say your constitutional law exam has a hypothetical statute that bans cloning, and you are asked to discuss a constitutional challenge to the statute. You see right away that Supreme Court cases protecting abortion but refusing to protect sodomy or a right to die may form the background law. Good, now go back and tell us how these cases will help you analyze the cloning statute. Don't spend your time writing about whether the abortion cases are rightly decided, about the ways that privacy has been a contested concept since the time of John Stuart Mill, or about the history of fundamental rights analysis. Analogize with a purpose. Figuring out how your exam problem resembles certain other problems that you have studied is crucial to top performance. But it's not enough to point out that your case is like Smith v. Jones. You have to show how Smith v. Jones will or won't help solve your case. Dinner table discussion provides the perfect model here. Let's say teenage Jenny sits down and explains a recent problem at work involving a co-worker. Everyone can tell the difference between responses from two types of family elders. Aunt Sarah, the family sage, might reply as follows. I faced a problem like that once. Here's how I handled it. Based on my experience, here's what you might try to cope with your situation. Note how Aunt Sarah raised a related issue, but then immediately brought the topic back to Jenny's problems. That's what you want to do. Now consider Uncle Fred's response to Jenny. Gee, dear, that reminds me of a story. Back when I was your age, 15 minutes go by, and Fred is still telling his tale. You recognize Uncle Fred as the family blowhard, and that's how you'll sound if your answer starts off. This case reminds me of Smith v. E. Jones, and you then spend the rest of your time merely discussing that case. Stay at the question's level of generality. Here's a good chance to remind you once again of the single most important rule of exam taking. Read the question carefully and answer the question asked. See tip hash 7. This time we want to urge you to read the question with an eye toward the level of generality that the professor is seeking. Thus, if the professor asks whether Jill can sue Sam when Sam draws water from a well lying under tracts of land owned by each, don't write a treatise on the difference between traditional rules of capture and the doctrine of correlative rights. Focus instead on whether Jill will prevail and under what circumstances. If, however, the professor asks for a comparison of the pros and cons of handling conflicts over water via traditional rules of capture, then by all means write at length about the wisdom of competing approaches. Don't switch instead to a more general discussion of whether we should have a private property system or to a less general discussion of whether in one particular case the traditional capture rule would be preferable. Ask yourself for each question whether the professor wants analysis of a particular fact pattern, a competing rule choice in a narrow area, or a general thematic discussion. Respond accordingly. Tip hash 22. Don't BS. You open up your torts exam and carefully read through the first long hypothetical. Terror fills your heart as you realize you just don't quite get what the question is driving at. You do understand that issues of negligence are involved, but you are afraid you won't be able to figure out how. The thought occurs to you that it would be a shame for you to do poorly on a negligence question. 
After all, you spent hours studying negligence, and you could write a sterling essay on the general characteristics of negligence and how it fits into tort law as a whole. You figure the professor won't penalize you too much. If you demonstrate sound command of the general principles, even if you only tangentially refer to how they fit back to the question. These kinds of baloney-filled essays may even have worked for you in college, so you are thinking of trying one again. Don't even try it. We law professors pride ourselves on our ability to spot exam dodging evasions, and it will be a matter of professional self-respect that we come down hard on you. There's a pretty simple reason why. If your experience as law students is anything like ours was, You've probably already figured out that law professors aren't hired on the basis of a drop-dead good looks. Be a sense of humor. See compassion for students or other living things. D. An ability to bring boring material to life. E. An ability to bring complex material to crystal clarity. F. An ability to cope with the world going on outside of the ivory tower. Or G. An ability to grade exams expeditiously. To be sure. Many law professors present company excluded, of course possess one or more of these traits. And if you're as fortunate as we were, you'll even have some who possess almost all of them. But we'll let you in on a deep, dark, dirty secret. There is only one talent that is common to virtually every professor currently teaching in an American law school. Moreover, once you understand the nature of this common talent, Everything else about legal education from the way we grade through the selection criteria for law review begins to make an odd sort of sense. Here's the secret. What we are good at is taking tests. Most of us have taken tests successfully throughout our lives. We went to law schools that happened to produce law professors. We did well enough on our law school exams to persuade others who did well on their law school exams to hire us for positions as judicial clerks government attorneys, or associates in blue-chip firms. We even did well enough on our law school exams that our law school professors who had also done well on their law school exams were willing to recommend us for jobs in the legal academy. And we were ultimately hired by other law professors, who in turn hold their own jobs because they too did well on their own law exams. If you think about it for a little while, and we try not to, Test-taking skills are a pretty paltry talent in the grand scheme of things. This may be one reason for the old adage that A. Students become law professors, B. Students become judges, and C. Students become rich. But the one thing you can count on is that a group of people selected for their ability to take tests will be able to spot it when you are bluffing in your efforts to take yours. So go back and read that torts hypothetical again. Take a stab at what you think the question is really about. Our bet is that you have a better idea than you think. But we're sure you won't get anywhere trying to bull your way through.